We need to talk about reactions. And I told you we're going to blaze through these reactions. And the reason is because there's hardly anything new. It's just a relearn, a rehash. And I don't know about you, but I always like it when these times happen because that just gives me extra time to really brush up on what I should know at this point. So this is the slide that I have left you with. And we talked about carbocation stability, and it was still the same. Tertiary, more stable than secondary, and more stable than primary. The difference is that now we will have these Vinlick carbocations that we will have to squeeze in to our list. And that's because we are starting with triple bonds. And those triple bonds will break into a double bond. And this gives us the Vinlick versions of carbocations that we have not yet seen. So primary still the lowest. Primary Vinlick, though, is the lowest out of the bunch. And tertiary is still the most stable. Now, let's do an example of what is in store for us with the alkyne reaction. So let me switch views. Let me go to my whiteboard and do our first chemical equation example. So here's example number one. Let's do a very simple alkyne. CH3, carbon, triple bond, carbon, and CH3. And let's add on what we talked about in the very beginning, and that's HBr or HCl or HI, something of that nature, some type of acid to this triple bond. This is where we started with alkenes, so it's where we'll start with alkynes. What do you think is going to happen before we do anything at all? What do you think is going to happen? Well, hopefully you've learned a procedure, and that procedure told you, Hey, we've got an electrophile, we've got a nucleophile. One comes into the presence of the other. That bond will break. Two sites of attachment will open up. H goes on one, Br goes on the other. Well, if that was okay with you as far as an explanation goes, good. You learned the alkene reactions like you were supposed to. And good, because you already know the alkyne reactions. That's right, let me say that again. You already know the alkyne reactions. So if you did your job and did the investment in the very beginning with the alkene reactions, folks, it is smooth sailing here. The only thing that you have to realize is that this stuff could happen in more than one step. So let's figure out what I mean by that. Here we have an alkyne. We're reacting with HBr. Before I do mechanisms, let's just take a look at the overall thing that will happen. Let's use our rules that we have discussed. So here I'm just going to put one. One HBr. That's it. What happens? Okay, well, this triple bond, one of these bonds will break. And two sites of attachment will open up. That's where they're going to be. H goes on to one carbon. Br goes on to the other. H plays with other Hs. Uh, folks, it doesn't really matter, does it? This carbon to the left, well, it doesn't have any Hs. And the carbon to the right doesn't have any Hs. So I'm just going to randomly slap a hydrogen on one side of it. And I'll put my bromine on the other side. Look at there. That's all that it was. Okay, well, what if we added another HBr? Because we can go back and look, folks, this is an alkene, and all the alkene reactions happen just like they did. Well, what that basically means is that I can rewrite the structure. I can add another HBr to this mess, and we can go another step. So if I add another HBr, same process happens. A bond will break. It takes me to an alkane. Two sites of attachment open up. One there, one there. H adds on to the carbon with the most Hs. Okay, well, that's the left-hand one clearly at this point. And Br 
adds on to the other. Guys, that's all that we've got to do. That's it. That's all of the Alcon reactions, with the exception of maybe one or two new tricks that we need to bring into the picture. This is it. No more than this. Okay, so let's talk about some terminology. Number one, notice what type of molecule that I end up with here. At the very end of this, we have bromines that are on the same carbon. Now, this is not called vicinal. All right, we talked about what that term meant uh, way back when, but this is going to be a different definition. And the reason is because these bromines are on the same carbon, not neighboring carbons. If the bromines are on neighboring carbons, that's a different term that we use to describe that structure. If the bromines or the chlorines or the iodines, the halogen, if they're on the same carbon, you've got to think of these as twins. They're identical. What's identical twins? Gemini. Gemini twins. You like the astrological signs? That's the way to keep in mind. These are called geminal from Gemini dihalides. All right, so this is just a term that we use to describe these types of compounds. Geminal dihalides are basically in reference to the halogens. Di means two, so two bromines in this case. And they are geminal on the molecule, which basically means they are attached to the same carbon in the structure. So there's one more new term that we can throw out to describe these types of products and molecules that we form and that we work with. Something else that I also want you to keep in mind is up at the very top. So sometimes what these questions will do is they'll say, here's an alkyne, and we're going to react this with HBr, and they'll put a 1 in front, and that's it. That's all that they'll do. Well, what that means is that they want you to stop at this point. They only want you to take one step and use that 1 HBr to break the triple bond to a double Two sites of attachment open, H goes on one, Br goes the other, and that's it. That's all that they want you to do. However, other times what they'll do is they'll write a two out in front, or they'll write the word excess on the arrow. This is a very clear-cut sign that they want you to take the HBr and go all the way to the very end as far as it can go. So two, of course, two steps. Taking the triple down to the double is step number one, and then taking the double down to a single, that would be step number two. So that's why they do two moles of HBr sometimes. To give you a clear understanding, they want you to go all the way. Other times, they'll write the word excess, and it means something completely identical. So excess HBr, take it as far as it can go. Take it from the alkyne and go all the way to the alkane with it. All right, so now that we understand kind of the overall picture, the bigger picture of what we're going to be doing, I want to talk to you a little bit about the mechanism again, because it seems like this is where people have problems. And this gives me another chance to reintroduce the mechanism, talk about how this actually happens, and then apply that to the alkene reactions that we talked about in the last lecture module. All right, so this way it will give you a very good review maybe. Okay, so here's our alkyne, and we're re reacting it with hydrochloric acid. Let's draw the curvy arrow mechanisms to show how this happens. So the first thing that I have to realize is that the HCl, this is a polar molecule. The HCl is electronegative. There's three sets of electrons around it, so it's partially negative. The hydrogen, because of that, is partially positive. All right, so there's an imbalance here. There's a charge distribution here, and this is what's going to create somewhat of an electrophile for me in terms of the hydrogen. Okay, so the triple bond, that is a very negative source. That is my nucleophile. So my nucleophile is always going to get my start of the arrow, and it always points to the positive piece. So it's going to point to the hydrogen, and it's going to rip that hydrogen off. Whoop! 
Come with me, Hydrogen. I'll give you a new home. I'll give you a better relationship if you just leave old nasty chlorine behind. And Hydrogen says, okay. All right, well, the chlorine here, it's electronegative. It wants the electrons. So the electrons between the H and the Cl, chlorine's going to get really mad. And it's going to say, go on, leave out of here. I don't want you no more, but you're going to leave all the money behind. So chlorine sucks up those electrons. All right, so what we have at this point, if this first part of the mechanism happens, is we have a CH3 a carbon that has now broken to a double bond, and then another CH3. Two sites of attachment opened up, and hydrogen goes on to one of these. It really doesn't matter which one. It's a symmetrical molecule at this point. I don't really care if you put it to the left or to the right. It means the same thing. And the other carbon will get a positive charge. Well, we also have Corey now that's all big and bad, all on his own, and he has those electrons from that bond, and now it carries a full-blown negative. So what we've done in this step is that we have formed, right now at this moment, a Vinlic carbocation. Do you see that? If we look at this setup, this carbocation is on a carbon that's with a double bond. This is a secondary vinlic. If you go back and take a look at that list, we reintroduced or we introduced these into that existing carbocation stability. So this is one of the carbocations now that we have to kind of think about when it comes to rearrangement. So will it rearrange? Well, if it goes left, it's still a secondary vinlic. And if it goes right-handed, it goes to primary. Uh-uh, don't want primary. So secondary vinlic is okay for this molecule at this point. It's not really going to really do anything. It's not going to shift. So what that means is that the chlorine, which is now our nucleophile because this is negative, that's where I want to start my arrow, that needs to point to the positive piece. And that positive piece is right there at that carbocation. Okay, so when we do this, well, I'm going to write the arrow, and I can keep trucking on in one line. If I've got room in a notebook paper, that's fine. I've got a CH3 group with a carbon, a hydrogen that points up, a double bond, a carbon, a CH3, and off of this carbon is my new chlorine. Okay, well, we're going to add HCl one more time because we can. We can still get a product from this. Folks, the mechanism is the same at this point. There is no difference. So, just like before, that HCl is polar. This is slightly negative. This is slightly positive. My double bond area, this is a negative source. My negative source is going to come in, and it's going to attack that hydrogen. It's going to pull it off, and hydrogen goes, okay. And then that chlorine says, okay, I'm an electron sucker. I'm going to take them, and the way they go. Just like before, the double bond is the one that actually breaks now. So I get a CH3, a carbon with a single bond. This had a hydrogen on it, and it opens up a bond that's freed up. That's where my hydrogen's going to end up going. All right, so on this carbon, I have a chlorine that's already here and then a CH3. I've just replicated it. That's all that I've done, and two sides of attachment open up. Hydrogen, because of Makovnikov's rule, go play with other hydrogens. That is what it wants to do. It looks at these two carbons, and it says, hey, hey, guys, I'm here to play around, and I only want to hang out with people like me. <laughs> so hydrogen, that's where it goes. And then on the other side, this opens up the carbocation attachment. All right, so I've got this chlorine that's swimming around, fully stacked with negatives. It sees that carbocation that has now formed. That carbocation is secondary. If it looks left-handed, it's still secondary. If it looks right-handed, 
its primary. So, folks, this is not going to move. It's going to be lazy, and it's going to say, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just going to stay here. There's no better route for me to go, right? It's kind of like a job. I'm perfectly okay with what I'm doing. You know, one job next to me, it's not going to pay me enough. The other job is basically what I'm doing now, and it's giving me the same amount of money now, but yet I've got to get up and I've got to move and I've got to, you know, go and change lives and change towns and cities and make new friends. I ain't going to do that. And it just stays put. All right, so in the last step of this mechanism, that negative chlorine, which is my nucleophile at this point, comes in and it's attracted to that carbocation. So I need to show that movement. When I do that, I'll finish up the last step of this mechanism and I get CH3 and then a carbon and then a carbon and then a CH3. Over to the left hand side, these two hydrogens, guys, I'm just going to condense down and I'm going to write it as CH2. I just simplified that up a little bit so it doesn't look as nasty. Then the right-hand carbon, it did have one chlorine on it, and now it's getting another chlorine on it. And there is the final product. Now I want you to look at the screen. If you followed me, if you followed my description and was okay with the majority of this, you're learning. Go back and take a look at the very first day that you took organic. Would you have even known what was going on at this point in time on that very first day of an organic chemistry class with me? If the answer was no, and now you look at all of this jumbled up garbage on your computer screen, and you're like, this is not too bad. I mean, these curvy arrows kind of make sense. The partial positives and negatives make sense. Showing the movement of where things go makes sense. You are learning organic. Can you believe it? All right, now let's go back and let's talk a look and, and think about names. Remember, I told you that organic is a buildup process. What do I mean by that? Let's look up here at step number one. Let's name this. We know how to name alkynes, don't we? Of course we do. One, two, three, four. This is a butyne. And where does that triple bond happen? It happens at carbon number two. One, two, three, four. So this is a two butyne. Two butyne reacts with hydrochloric acid to give me a product. What does it give me? Well, it gives me this. Let's name it. It's an alkene. What's the name of this alkene? Oh, we're going back. We're going back in previous modules. One, two, three, four. This is a butene. Carbon number two. One, two, three, four that way. Is that good? Nah, wrong. Why? Well, if a number from the left, that carbon gets two. If a number from the right, that carbon gets a 2. It's going to give me a 2 no matter what. So I need to look at other things that are on the molecule to make this decision. And I see a chlorine now that's hanging out. It needs some attention. It feels lonely. So you're going to prioritize it. One, two, three, four. So because the double bond was a tie, you were going to get 2 butene no matter what you did. And now because that chlorine is on there, it forces us to number on the right hand side and we're going to get 2-chloro, 2-butene. Look at there. There's our alkene names that are coming back. And then we're not done because we can go further and we can go back even further in that lecture module series and talk about the nomenclature of alkanes. How do we do this? Well, this is an alkane. This is a butane. It's all single bonds. Well, which side do I number? Closest to the substituents. It looks like that would be right-handed. So this is carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4. That will give me lower numbers on the chlorines. So on carbon 2 and on carbon 2, I'm going to get a dichloro. Folks, I told you it is a buildup process, and here's a prime example. So 2-butyne reacts with hydrochloric acid, and that will give me 2-chloro-2-butene. 2-chloro-2-butene will react with another round of hydrochloric acid, and that will give me 
dichlorobutane. All right, so now we see where this is headed. And at the same time, this is why a final exam is easily cumulative. This is just the nature of organic. This is what happens. So if this is what happens and we constantly bring out that older material that we thought we could just shove under the rug and cover up and not remember anymore, well, mm, if that's the case, then you've not been paying attention to an organic because there are no rugs in this house. We can't sweep anything under the rug and forget about it. And here's a prime example. So before we do our next example, again, a review of terms. Here is a geminal dichloride, right? The two chlorines are sharing the same carbon, so these are twins. So these are the Gemini twins. So geminal dichloride is what we have on that alkane. All right, so let's do our next example because this was pretty simple. It was a symmetrical alkyne in the very beginning, right? Okay, so let's do something that's not symmetrical. Let's do a CH3 and then a CH2 and then a carbon and a triple bond, a carbon and a CH3 group. And let's add HCl and we'll write the word excess on here. And the only thing that I want is just the final product. That's it. Nothing more than that. So how do we do this? All right, well, we'll rewrite the starting reagent like we've always done up to this point. I mean, that's perfectly okay. So I'm going to look at this triple bond, and we're going to break the triple bond, and we're going to add two sites of attachment. There we go. So hydrogen comes in first, and hydrogen plays with other hydrogens. It looks at the carbon to the left, it looks at the carbon to the right of the original, and it goes, you know what? There's no hydrogens on either one of these. So I don't really care which one I go to. That's the problem with alkynes. Maybe not a problem, depending on how you look at it. But let me explain what I mean by that in just a minute. So at this point, you're like, Okay, if it doesn't really matter, hydrogen plays with other hydrogens, but neither carbon has a hydrogen. I'm just going to put hydrogen here on the left-hand side. That's perfectly okay. Not a problem. And then chlorine is going to come in and take the spot that's going to be here because that carbocation will not rearrange. Its only choice is a primary or another venlic. It's not going to do it, all right? Okay, well, it said excess. So that means I'm going to take this and I'm going to break another bond and that will open up two more sites of attachment. And H comes in and plays with other H's. Well, it's now locked into play. It sees the hydrogen on the left and hydrogen is forced to go there. And then the chlorine is forced to go here, creating another geminal dihalide. Well, I can clean this side up on the left. Right, we often said we don't really like to write hydrogens like this, so I'll just write a CH2 like that. I'll condense it down and I'll just erase these and say there's a cleaner kind of structure that we want to look at. So here is choice number one, and if you give me choice number one, you are correct. But that's not the only option. Why? Well, let's do this again. CH3, CH2, carbon, triple bond, carbon, and then CH3. All right, well, same thing. Triple bond, one breaks, two sides of attachment open up, here and here. Well, in the first round, you said, hey, hydrogen's going to come in and it's going to play with other hydrogens, but there's no hydrogens on these carbons. Where's it going to go? And we put it on the left. Well, you could put it on the right, too. No one says that you can't. And then that means chlorine's going to have to go here. If that's what you do, then in the next step, guess what? The double bond is going to break. We get a single bond, two sides of attachment open up, hydrogen plays with other hydrogens, and now it is locked into place and hydrogen is forced to go there. And then chlorine comes in, and chlorine has to go there, creating another geminal dihalide. Well, I'm going to simplify this up. 
So I'll just draw CH2 like this, and I'll just erase those hydrogens, just condense it down a little bit. There you go. And folks, this is a second choice. Are these different? Yes, they're different. Why? How do you know? Name them. That's the easiest way. Name them. If you look at the one to the left, what you have created, one, two, three, four, five, is a pentane. And if you number closest to the end, one, two, three, four, five, on carbon two, and on carbon two, you have a dichloro. This is a 2,2 dichloropentane. That's different than the one here. The one here, it looks like this is going to be a 3,3 three dichloropentane. Now you see the problem with organic. You know, very often in a laboratory environment, I will tell people, 60% yield, folks, you are doing good. This is, not or, this is not general chemistry. General chemistry, you know, we really like for you to be in the high 80s and 90s as far as percent yield goes. That means you did your lab work really, really well. In organic, 60 is the new A. Well, not in this class and not on my test, but in the lab, 60% yield is extremely good. And the reason is because of things like this. There's no rhyme or reason. Both of these get formed. Both of these are okay. Both of these happen. And this is going to decrease your percent yields on one product only because you're getting a mixture of products that you have no control over. Because keep in mind, the mechanism did not care. The mechanism did not care which one this was going to go to. Now, can we still talk about majors and minors? The answer is yes. We can still do that. Later on, we might even see some of those examples. But as of right now, you need to understand that a mixture of things begin to go on. And sometimes these questions will want you to write all possibilities. You have to be careful with that word. If the question does tell you, write them all, then this is what you have to do. You have to give all possible choices that are out there. However, if the question, like we've seen before sometimes in other ones, talk about major products, then that means one of these is going to be preferred over the other in the version of the mechanisms. And we've got to figure out which one that might be a little bit later on down the road. All right. So, guys, here's your example of adding acid onto an alkyne. Very similar to an alkene. There is no difference in them except it takes part in two steps. If you give it enough acid. If you limit the acid, we can control it in a way, and we can get a double bond involved in this mix as well. Now, does that mean that if I only do one, that I don't get these at all? No. No, that's not what that means. But on a sheet of paper, that's what that means. In real life, that one mole of HCl would react with that triple bond. It would break it to a double. However, there's also chances that another molecule of this triple bond and another molecule of HCl will be in the mix, and it will be, and that HCl will not react with that triple bond. It could actually come in contact with that double bond and create one of these down here. So we will get another mixture. But on a sheet of paper, this is what we do. In real life, that's not really how it works. Okay, That's just what we have to deal with when it concerns organic. So in the next video, we'll pick up another reaction that we learned about with alkenes, and this is going to be the addition of maybe bromine or chlorine.